Hey, my brother. What's up, How are you? Man, I'm well. How are you doing, man? Good, good, good. Thanks for having me. Man, thank you so much for uh, being on the You Know Desi show. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, so I don't want to take up a lot of your time. I know you're, you're a busy guy over there. So, Not me. <laughs> so um, for those who necessarily don't know you, um, the, one of the reasons I wanted to reach out to you is because uh, you're doing a lot of great work over with Live Nation Urban. I've been seeing some of your interviews with, uh, you know, different people and celebrities and uh, and people within the industry. And I know we tried to schedule it this uh, last week, but it was a blackout. And yeah. that was a deal just because we didn't know if we were supposed to be working, if we were supposed to be having meetings, if we were just supposed to be um, posting positive things. So, um, so please tell everyone who you are and, and what you do, man. No, for sure. So uh, my name is Brandon Pinky. I am Vice President of Business Development and Operations for Live Nation Urban. Uh, Live Nation Urban is a joint venture with Live Nations, which is with the world, excuse me, world's largest um, live entertainment company. So all the major concerts, major festivals that happen globally, I um, am a part of that, and particularly in hip hop, R&B, and gospel. So okay. Rockley Music Festival, I'm one of the producers on the Roots Picnic in Philadelphia, okay. Lights Her. Uh, Louisiana Fest with Lil Wayne and, and yeah. Cat Club and theater shows um, with, with some of your favorite artists. So, man, excited to be here and um, excited to speak with you. So thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, let's get right into it. Um, uh, Live Nation Urban had definitely came up on my radar because I, I've been dealing with uh, Live Nation and House of Blues uh, specifically uh, for quite some time. Uh, I used to throw a lot of parties in uh, Dallas, Houston, and New Orleans. And... Mm -hmm. Um, and then I was made aware when I was doing some things with uh, Michael Malden, Jermaine Dupree's dad. Yep. Um, so I know he's done things with you all in the past, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, or at least is aware of you. So I used to do some marketing for like the, um, the Bad Boys reunion tour. I helped him in Dallas and Houston. And then also with knowing everyone uh, within the Live Nation organization, like Tim Jorgensen is somebody that I've worked with for years and years. And I know he was with uh, over the region of House of Blues, and he used to be in Dallas as a GM and mm -hmm. went to Anaheim and Vegas and things like that. So uh, at one point, he was even telling me, uh, you know, that you guys were looking for some people in Cali and some other places. And then Al Branch is a good friend of mine. Oh, nice. Well, so, yeah. yeah. Now, Al, so, I mean, the, the, the genesis of that, Al um, is actually a partner in Maverick, which is the, the world's largest artist management company. And I actually had a role there um, as director of touring and helping with touring with all the artists there. So Al and I, you know, been working for years. Yeah, so so it's surprising that we haven't connected before now, but now yep. we have to, you know, connect even more offline as well. Yes, yes sir. So, um, so please talk about the, the current state of everything, because, of course, the, the pandemic stopped all concerts and tours um, right. much, but I've still been seeing, um, specifically Live Nation Urban, with still being active and, and trying to do things, whether that's content and, uh, and different things like that. So can you speak, uh, speak on that? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, like, let's talk about where we're at COVID, right? So as you've seen, as the world's seen, all concerts have been shut down. There haven't been any live events. We're slowly starting to open back up and, and, and pick back up. And you're noticing the drive-in concept is, is picking up steam. Yeah. What we see in the fall are socially distant shows, right, in clubs and theaters. And so we're going to have, you know, if there's a thousand capacity uh, room or venue, we'll probably have about 500 people in there. Yeah. We're going to slowly get back into, into the groove. And so in 2021, we fully expect all of our festivals, all of our shows to be back you know, at full capacity, um, but with a lot more safe measures, right? And, I, and honestly, I think they're good. You know, I one with a fever now coming into it or, or last year. So now that we'll have fever monitoring systems, now that we'll have hand sanitizers, now that we'll have things that, you know, people can be clean. Yeah. I'm okay. Like that's, that, you know, if there's one good thing that come, comes out of this is people are now, you know, having some sort of hygiene, you know, with, with themselves when they're, they're around 20 other thousand people. So, yeah. Um, for me but i think we're going to see what we're going to see is not only the live shows coming back but they're going to come back different i think what we're seeing with virtual shows everything from versus to every live stream you've seen with, mm -hmm. with artists i think people are more uh, accepting of live streams now so yeah. now have a show guess what x you know fill in the blank brand partner can now stream that 
And we're going to have, instead of a few people, we're now going to have thousands of people watching it and actually engaged in a live stream in a way that we weren't prior to this happening. So we're going to see some small tweaks and things happening. And then I also think we're going to have more automated um, aut automated systems in place for food and beverage, yeah. for just very simple things that you don't think about when you're at a show. Uh -huh. Just with those, for sure. Yeah, and, and I think it's a great opportunity for, um, you know, not only the, the virtual shows, but, like, take something like a Coachella. Like, yep. uh, people aren't always, um, you know, you have a certain segment of people that want to go and be in that crowd, and there's so many people, and, and, you know, it can get expensive to go to certain shows, right? If you're talking about, like, if I'm in Texas and I'm try, trying to travel to Cali, I kind of got to plan it out differently and get flights and, hotels and rentals and things like that or right. if, if i'm in at my home i may decide that i want to see beyonce at mm -hmm. coachella but i don't want to necessarily go and take off work and things like that so this is a good option um and and i'm just i'm interested to see the whether it's going to be a lot of pay-per-view shows or if it's going to be you know free or how that's kind of rolled out um, for, I think it's going to be a mixture of all those things. And I think, again, the free shows more than likely are going to be sponsored. You're going to see more. They're already starting pay-per-view models. Yeah. Uh, and I think, again, prior to this happening, no one or, or very few, you know, from a percentage wise would say, hey, I'm going to pay for a pay-per-view to see this artist if they're going to be in my city anyway. I I'll just pay for them live. But now, because of COVID, because of people, you know, actuality and fear of safety, like I don't necessarily want to be around X amount of thousands of people. They may spend money on that pay-per-view so again we're going to see different monetization models yeah uh, important um that we continue to work and craft on those models because they, they it's going to be ever-changing and i think we're going to get to a place where we're going to be in a, a much better place i don't know if you saw a goldman sachs article but you know the music industry by 2030 is going to be at 30 it's a 30 billion dollar business so this is yeah. literally this year is you know take it for granted you know it's not it's going to be thrown away by 2021 2022 we're yeah. actually going to be thriving and I think that some of these other things in place from the live streams to virtual reality, augmented reality, there are going to be other things surrounding the live shows that, that's going to actually make the music industry uh, richer than it is now. Well, yeah. And, and the other thing that I like about it is you're forcing artists to be more creative. Like, uh, I like what Travis Scott did. Uh, I, I've liked what um, um, Tory Lanez has done with the quarantine radio and different things like that. And even partnering with somebody like a YouTube. Yeah. Uh, uh, for a show, but I think that's because you start to get more um, with, with that creativity, you, you have to put more into your show, especially if people are only viewing it online, like gone are the days uh, that you will be able to just kind of sit there with a microphone and just do your song, like only so many people are going to watch that when they can just listen to it, you know? But let's think about that. I think from, again, from a music perspective, it was, let's go back to January. Yeah. I I'm going to make 80 to 90 percent of my revenue from touring. Yeah, that is not the case. If I'm now going into a venue that's 50 percent sold, I'm not going to make as much money as I as I was. That's just it's simple economics, right? So now I have to rely on other industries and and really create more of a creative ecosystem. So now Travis Scott, I may not be able to go on tour, but let me partner with a video game, and now I'm going video gaming and and music is coming together in a compelling way. Maybe in the future, you know, I'm going to to partner with a sports, you know, it, it, maybe I am the official, I don't know, let's call it, I'm at halftime for multiple shows for, for a league, for NFL or NBA. Who knows what type of deals are going to be created? But yeah. I think it's about taking those different verticals and, you know, putting myself in, in a position, I think this is on managers and executives and yeah. labels, you know, particularly labels with 360 deals for their artists mm -hmm. to involved in different um, areas outside of the music industry. Yeah, and um, and I, I really like the partnerships as well. Like, and and I feel like at the end of the day, the cream rises to the top. Like, um, there are, are millions of DJs going live and things like that, that. But the fact that D Nice jumped out there first, he had the best sound. He he was the most consistent. I think mm -hmm. he did a great job. And I even saw him partner with like the NBA. And one day he was going live DJing on the NBA's live stream. Yeah. And, and so just seeing the way brands are, are looking at the technology and willing to partner with, um, you know, new and innovative artists and DJs and things like that, I think that's uh, really important as well. Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's just it's different ways to reach that core audience that you want. If you look at where IG Live is now, yeah. as compared to where it was, again, January, February, it's, it's exploded. You look at Versus, mm -hmm. you know, 
my life would I think my mother and, and my grandmother would have their own Instagrams and are watching, you know, Babyface versus Teddy Riley. Like, it's insane, you know, what's happening and how it's actually drawing together different generations while we've been in quarantine to enjoy events together. That's something that wasn't happening. If I enjoyed a particular artist, I was there with my friends and my, and my core age group. Now we're getting multiple generations coming together. Yeah. It's actually, it's, it's interesting how we're, I would argue that we have actually become closer overall as a culture. And you actually see that with the protests as you see, you know, multiple, you know what I mean? Ethnicities, everyone coming together in support of one thing. And, and that's what I, it's overall, that's what I've been seeing. Yeah, and and um, and piggybacking off of that, I think the fact that everyone was forced to slow down uh, mm -hmm. in a sense has been a good thing because now people can connect more. Uh, when when you're flying all over the place and I'm flying all over the place, it may be a lot harder for us to connect and actually sit down and have an IG live conversation. Correct. Right. You know, and people are now checking their DMs more often and doing research on things uh, when in, in the past they just be on the go 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 all the time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, now, I want to I want to go back a little bit. I know you mentioned that um, you were with Maverick as well. So kind of talk about how your career started and how it got to where you are today. Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, I'm going to try to truncate this because, you know, I, know I got the time. But, um, you know, I started off in, and I, I consider myself a little bit of a robot. Right. I was able to do different things in this industry to kind of form, you know, who I am today. But started off in business manager management. Yep managed the finances for artists. And at the time, those athletes as well. Those artists included Jill Scott and The Roots and, and Kanye West and, and a few others. Okay. From there, we slowly transformed and, you know, started working with Lil Wayne and Drake and Nicki Minaj. We're really working on their touring and managing tours and managing the budgets and hiring the crew and everything, all the experience that we had developing tours and developing touring careers. Because that's one thing, particularly in hip hop, particularly in R&B, there are artists that tour and there are touring careers. And that's why if you've seen in other genres, you can see you too and, and, and they can tour until they're, you know, 90 years old and people will come to those uh, shows. Yeah. You weren't too much in, 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 in hip hop and R&B and, and, and our genres. And so um, we started working on that. From there, that company, that, can you see me? Okay, yeah. That uh -huh. company partnered with print artist management um and it was okay. sold to live nation um and then it became a part of that maverick conglomerate from there i was a director of touring and business development for for maverick urban which was you know all the artists from ti the, the Nicki minajs and, and g easy's and so on yeah. so, um afterward yeah. um that's when we started the president sean g who's a partner in maverick started live nation urban brought me over um uh, to run business development and operations, and that's where where I've been since. But it's really taken me from business management to artist management to to the promoter side, and really giving me a, a yeah. full picture of what this industry uh, is. Yeah, that, that's really great, and um, and so um, uh, and I I just wanted to ask you about it because at one point when we were talking to uh, Tim Jorgensen, I do an event called uh, if it doesn't feel like if it don't feel like '90s R&B. And, uh, and Al Branch has been, you know, he's been helping me champion it as well. He may have uh, told you about it. I'm not sure. But uh, it's basically like a concept where we take 90s R&B um, artists and, uh, and we'll have, like, people doing covers. But, like, in the past, we've had Teddy Riley host one. We've had Maya perform at one. We've had Angie Stone perform. And it's just taking that... 90s R&B feel and some people dress up and come to the show but we have been doing them a lot with House of Blues and so in probably the 400 uh, size and we were uh, about to start building it up to like the 1,000, 1,500 uh, style venues up under Live Nation so, um, so and, and I know how you guys partnered at some point with uh, Duce Palooza as well, correct? Or was that kind of a separate thing? That was Live Nation proper, that wasn't Live Nation Urban yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So how do you, how does it determine who kind of gets what? Um, it's not kind of who kind of gets what. I mean, we, we develop our own events and platforms. I mean, everything for the most part is new. I mean, we had a partnership with Broccoli City that we wanted to develop. Uh -huh. It was Spotify for Rap Caviar Live, took their playlist and turned that into a live show. Okay. Um, a lot of things on our own, man. And it's really about finding the right partners, strategic yeah. partners, 
and growing and scaling those particular shows and festivals that we're in. I mean, when we started with Rockley City, it was around 10,000, 11,000, mm -hmm. you know, came on board, put in certain systems in place, that 10 turned into 30,000. And so that's, that's part of the vision with Live Nation Urban is A, create world-class great events yeah. in hip hop and gospel, um, but also, you know, making sure that we are building the next black executives in the in the live industry because we need to have more of us in there. So, I, you know, we're, we're here to do a, a multitude of things and really help. In okay. long Femme Forward was yours then, correct? Femme Forward was under Live Nation Urban and, and yeah. uh, the person who conceptualized it, Heather Lowry, is now the CEO of Femme Forward. It's now a joint venture within Live Nation. Um, okay. So company now. Yeah. Shout out yeah. To Heather. yeah, just trying to understand everything. Cause... Sure. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, man, I know you're on limited time. Uh, tell me what's next for you, and, uh, and then we can kind of get you out of here, man. Um, we're working on stuff that I um, – you'll see it coming <laughs> this week. You'll see some things coming. I mean, we're, we're, we're steady working on ideas, working on partnerships. Yeah. We're going to come out of this, and I think all of us are going to come out of this, this entire landscape, this entire climate um, in, our, in, in the U.S. And, and in the globe, really. We're going to come out of it stronger. We're going to come out of it smarter, more creative. I, I've always said that, um, you know, our creative economy is, is the U.S.'s greatest export. And I, you know, Live Nation Urban and, and Black culture in general are the drivers of that creative economy. And so we're going to come out of it better. Well, yeah. And are you based in Philly or are you based in L.A.? I know you kind of all over the place, right? Philly till I die. Uh, Philly till you die? Till I die. See, yeah. I'm from Texas, but I'm actually an Eagles fan. So I'm, I'm hoping you're an Eagles fan as well. You're a smart, you're, you're a smart man. You're smart. <laughs> so I came over. Well, fly Eagles fly, man. And, uh. I appreciate the time and I look forward to connecting with you, um, you know, more offline so we can do some things together. Right, thank you, man. Thank you. Take care.